بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم ألهمنا مراشد أمورنا وأعذنا من شرور أنفسنا It has been the habit for the last perhaps about one and a half years that if ever there is a program on a Thursday night, then it is explaining some surah of the Quran al-Kareem. This started when the lockdown started, the first announcement was made of a corona attack in South Africa and the government went into a state of panic. So at that time, what came to the mind is that the greatest weapon and shield that we have is our Quran. And at that time the program started from the house and surah by surah, alhamdulillah, now we have reached Qad Sami Allah, the 28 Jews. Why this, the purpose of explaining Quran and reading Quran during this time, which was regarded as a very difficult time, is one is that many a person understands that this is a book of hidayat, it is a book of guidance. And then you say, go for the bayan, listen to the bayan, you will get some guidance. Go and become an alim, you will learn the meaning of Quran. Very few people understand that there is no power in the world as powerful as this Quran. There is no power in the world as powerful as this Quran. Sometimes the person will say, wow, that amil, like he stops. This one jinn was troubling me. And I went to him and he did his reading and he did his blowing and things happened. How does he know what he's doing? There is no power in the world as powerful as this Quran. In this recent, perhaps two and a half, three months, now when what is called the side effects of Corona is coming into people. So the wave finished and the second wave came, perhaps the third wave. What we saw was perhaps the worst of the waves. Because those that came out of it alive are living alive, but they like dead. So as we sit and speak to them, and so many have mentioned already the incidents, that it is not like even scary to mention that after the corona, there's a side effect that comes. It could be after two months, after three months, after four months. There are some people who relate it back to corona. They are those that will never understand it could be related. There are students in the madrasa we have who are becoming very good alims. Top marks. And then Corona hit and then they got better. And after that they needed to go on to sleeping tablets. You could see it in their face. You could see it in their eye. He can't sleep at night. Any small noise. We had to shift him from one room into another room. Where there's hardly any noise. He still can't sleep there. Then as I was walking with him I asked him one question. Did you ever suffer from Corona? So he said yeah but that was about three, three months ago. I said, this is side effect of it. I said, how do you find yourself at night? He said, during the night I actually can feel something is near me. I can feel it there and then in that condition I have to try and sleep because now he has to sleep alone. So I told him, read Surah Baqarah. Read Surah Baqarah. And if you can't read the whole thing, start reading. My brother Imran then he met somebody who also had corona, so they mentioned to him that there's a lot of satanic effect in this. The person he was speaking to is a person who we'll regard as like modern in the world, who's not supposed to believe in jinn and jadu. But that person went through it. So when they said, you know, there's a feeling that there's something satanic about it, this person says, forget the feeling, I'm convinced it's satanic. He says, I would see the devil in front of me. And it would be saying to me, you're not going to get out of my hands. He said, I would see it at a certain time at night. And if I wanted to mention to my family, then immediately they'll say, because you're sick, your mind is seeing things. So my brother told him, read Surah Baqarah. I was sitting by an old friend and he's coming out of the corona, so breathing is not so easy for him. So I said, forget the breathing and the tiredness. How is your sleep at night? So first he said, no, no, I sleep. 
Like how normally a person will say, nothing wrong. But when I gave him few examples of how people are suffering, so he says that it's only me and my wife that knows that at night I can feel someone touching me. And I told my wife that it's not right. And how are you going to sleep after that? That fear, you gripped. You just close your eyes and you hear a feet touch. Then you wake up, you think it's your wife who touched you. She's fast asleep. I said, read Surah Baqarah. And as I started going to houses after this and just saying that there's a lot of side effects in this. In nearly every house I'm mentioning, I see one person saying, what you said, what you said? Meaning he's also going through it. If Corona did a lot of damage to the world, then one of the damages is going to be the side effect now that's coming. That it opened up a window for the jinn. Perhaps that window was never opened before in such a manner. Drugs opened up for them. Television opened up for them. But how does Corona manage to open up that window, we will never understand. But it came through. And if Corona side effects can be so bad, in the books of Tafsir they mention an incident that in the time of the Bani Israel, when a certain jinn was given the job of pulling a Abid, a very great worshipper, down from his height. So the shayateen, like how we have our gatherings and our groups and our mashwaras, they also have this. So the eye fell on a certain worshipper and one would say to the other, this one is irritating us. He doesn't mix with women, he doesn't eat the food of the normal people, he's staying in his high position, where he's ever going to come down. Are you going to manage to get a girl to go up? So they said, we need some shaitan to somehow get into him and break him from the inside. So one shaitan was designated. He took the form of a very pious man and he comes into the village. It's a very long incident mentioned in the books of Tafsir. But how he managed to get into that man's circle? In a very pious garb. And then he comes and knocks. That person is high in his, whatever they call that, monastery. He got nothing to do with the world. This pious person says, I heard of your piety. Your fame has spread all over. I need to spend time with you. First the pious person is reluctant, but then he allows him and this individual comes up. And now in that one place there are two people. But because one is the shaitan, if he has to make salah the whole day also, he won't get tired. If he doesn't have to eat, it doesn't affect him really. So the pious man saw that there is someone even more pious than me now. Because he is getting hungry when he tells this person, come join me. He says, no me, I don't eat much. You eat. And he started getting worried that what if the news goes out that the new man who came is even more pious than me. Then the people will not ever come and offer me and say make dua and pray for me. They'll come and start telling him pray for me. So he started becoming irritated with this jinn. And he's trying to say, now when are you going? You came, how long are you going to stay? So finally this jinn in the form of a pious man says that I stayed with you. At the beginning I thought you were someone great, but not much in you. But I thank you like. He says, but because you gave me the chance, I'm going to leave by you one word. You must read this. So the man says, what am I going to do with it? He says, if anyone is ever afflicted with a jinn, very strong, very strong jinn, then you read this word over that person and that effect will pull out immediately. So this man said that I don't need that because I don't see patience. And I'll never allow myself to ever enter into this field, especially because women are the bigger patients than men. Remember this, women are the bigger patients than men in this game. We have heard certain examples or incidents. We will not even think of going to verify it or investigate it. But we heard certain where there was a fear that a certain girl, when she was afflicted with the jinn, and the amil then said that for her to get cured, she has to stay in the same locality where I am. And then later on she passed away. She passed away. 
And there's lot of examples like this. We will never know why she passed away. But there were those stories that that she was murdered. Now why she had to be murdered, what story did she have to tell, we will never know. But an individual who allows his sister to be brought close to a man, no matter how pious that man may seem, he will find himself walking the route of what happened in this incident which I'm going to mention. So he said, you read this. And wherever the jinn has hit, you read it, it will. He said, I don't need this. I don't get involved in this. He said, just leave it by you. And then he goes away. Jinn are jinn. Their tra- trap is a very long trap. And you can never link point one to point two to point three. How are you going to link it? It doesn't seem at all like it's connected. But after 20 years, when you start joining the dots, you will see it all started from this point. This happened, this made that happen, that made that happen. And then you will understand when a conspiracy is made, it could run over a period of 100 years sometimes also. Nothing happens immediately. The Ottoman Empire had to be collapsed. It was a khilafat which stood in the way of shaitan and his plans. How do you bring a khilafat down? Youngsters from the lands of Turkey, that's the capital of the Muslim world. Youngsters from the land of Turkey are taken to study in England. They become known as the Young Turks. Why will Britain ever want to train Muslims? They showed a very happy face. Britain becomes the friends of the Turks. They are building the submarines for them. So much of kindness, so much of goodness. But they will teach them in England whatever they have to teach. They got a very long story. The Young Turks are brought back. A world war is going to start. One side might be Germany and Austria. The other side might be the Allied forces. Muslims are nowhere in the war. One of the ministers decides to say that German soldiers, so German soldiers had already come. For a while they were training the Muslim soldiers. So the Muslims and Germany were very good friends. And the Muslims were amazed at Germany's manner of fighting the weapons they were creating, how they trained their forces. Main, main people of Germany were sent to train the Muslims. So this is my teacher now, you start becoming inclined. Now when your teacher says to you that if the allied forces attack us, will you help us? Main ministers signed secret agreements. The Khalif doesn't know about it. The Sultan doesn't know about it. The main ministry doesn't know about it. But it's signed. That if ever Germany has to go to war, if ever, meaning it won't happen, then Turkey will also join the side of Germany. There's no real problem because Germany is the superpower of the world. No one will ever bring it down. And when the war happens, and how it happens, and Turkey realized they're being pulled into a war, everything was planned, point one, point two, point three. To such an extent that when the Turkish military is looking at the situation, they said in that one place, Palestine, Britain is not going to attack there. They got nothing there. They said in that other place, Britain won't attack. Three places or four places, they said Britain won't attack. So let's pull our soldiers away from there, bring them here. That's the places they attacked. What made them say that they won't attack? You had someone inside. You had those soldiers pulled out. Whatever they wanted... When Israel was formed, and after so many years that passed, when a person reads the books of history today, they will say, join the dots. Everything happened with another purpose in mind. Nothing ever just happens out of the blue. Fifteen years down this line, people will say, it started when Afghanistan's issue came to an end. The war of Iraq came to an end. Then people said, it started with 911. But when 911 took place, no one ever thought that 911 is for some other purpose in the world. The whole world changed after that. Fifteen years down the line, when we will see a new world, you will say it started with Corona. And perhaps when we will see a new South Africa, 
We will say it started with Corona and the looting that followed after Corona. Even that looting that followed was not a normal looting. Nothing ever starts so sudden and ends so sudden. Nothing ever happens in such a manner that no main person gets arrested. No country has ever spoken about we were almost overthrown. And thereafter nothing is done about those who try to overthrow them. Nothing. In your own school or madrasa, if you hear that one teacher tried to overthrow me, that principal won't sleep. Every day he will be looking for proof to take out the other person. This government slept very nicely. So relaxed they are, so relaxed. Whereas they know there was such a movement that we almost got overthrown. Relax. More yaqeen they have than the believers of the world in that. Like, relax, don't worry. Nothing will happen. Nothing will happen because nothing is meant to happen. Fifteen years down the line when man wants to join the dots. So he left one paper by him. And then he went. When the jinn goes, it only starts after that. Now he goes to a nearby village and he starts afflicting people. This person is screaming in pain. That uncle is screaming in pain. You always start clean before you go dirty. And when the doctors of the village don't know what to do, then you see from the outskirts of the village one very great doctor is walking in. He is an army, top army of the time. People ask him, where are you coming from? He says, I'm on a journey. He said, what's your occupation? He says, me, I do dumb. When people are afflicted with very heavy jinn, I'm the man. Say, this is the dua I was making so long. Came at the right time. Right time. Take him immediately to the old man. He looks at him. Like how an army will normally tell you, what's his name? Isn't this his name? He got a brother. You're amazed already. Finished. He just has to tell you your brother's name. Finished. After that, whatever he or she says, that fortune teller will just say to you, isn't you live in this one town? How you know? Finished. They will say, isn't you and your mother-in-law never used to get along? Which daughter-in-law ever got along with the mother-in-law? She will say, how you know that? She says, I can see it in the smoke. You can't see it. Look properly. And when that girl starts looking, a jinn will take the form of her mother-in-law. And then that marriage will collapse there and there. Who was the jadu? It was the jinn. To sort out the problem is the jinn. But when the problem gets sorted out, be ready for a major problem coming after. It doesn't end. That is why we said, find your power in Quran. In every other way, it's not going to work. It will only get worse. It will only get worse. He left the paper. He afflicted the people. Then he read over them. They got better. This is the boss of the town. And then he carries on his job. Hitting and curing. Hitting and curing. Hitting and curing. And then he hits a certain family. And when they call him, he says, this is jinn that is so strong that I don't have the power to fight it. He says, if there's someone who can fight this, there's one man I know. He says, he lives on the outskirts. He says, he doesn't do this. He says, he doesn't give his secrets, I know him. He does this. If there is someone so powerful, it's him. That girl is taken with her family. When you see your daughter screaming in pain, you will give your life to whoever is able to cure her. For which reason, when Dajjal will make his appearance one day, he will make his appearance at the beginning as a herbalist, as a curer. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he will rub his hand over someone whose skin is not right. And the skin will come right. Which mother doesn't want her daughter's that whiteness of that face to go away? So I went to Sheikh so and so. I told him, Sheikh, make dua for me. He lifted his hands. He says, make sabr, make sabr, auntie. He says, the only thing Sheikh knows is sabr. I want a miracle. Sheikh had no miracle. 
She says, I went to Morana, I went to Hafizab. She said, then I went to that one. Wow. That wow means he did something and the whiteness started disappearing. Even if they say to that auntie, but he doesn't make parda from young girls, she is not bothered about that. She says, you know how pious he is. We saw certain people who the army will help them. During the day, he's a mechanic under the car. In the evening, he's a top amil. There's nothing wrong with being an amil. He's like a doctor. But where the town people call him so and so, meaning mechanic, the family who he treated call him Hazrat. For me, it was like, what a sanad came already. He never studied at all. They call him Hazrat, Hazrat, everything Hazrat, Hazrat. There was a need for dua. They were not bothered about the dua of the shuyukh of the time. They said, Hazrat will make dua. The day the Jal walks like a Hazrat, he will just put his hand over a face. And when that white face goes away, how many other Muslims will be behind him? And if it said, but this is evil, the answer will be that, did you cure my daughter? Did you cure my daughter? Heading towards a world where it will be difficult. Where a person will be told, sabr is better than falling. Search for an alternative, but don't make a mistake. Don't let your iman be taken in the fear of what will happen to my body. After a looting in South Africa, every businessman will say, I heard that you must not insure, I listened. And they told me also that if you don't insure, Allah will look after you. Where was Allah? So the next time the insurance man comes, that person will say that how much more I must listen to the ulama. Had I not listened to them, I would never have been where I am today. And then he will take out that insurance. Don't ever look for an alternative where perhaps it's the very jinn who's bringing the problem. This is a world of imtihan and as we go towards the end, be ready, the imtihan can get more difficult. My intention was to translate the surah, but it seems perhaps we won't get there. But one verse of the surah that after the ruku, Allah Tabarakullah says, "Ma asab bin musibatin illa bi idnillah." That remember, whenever a calamity comes, it only comes because Allah said, "Come." Wa ma yu'min billahi yahdi qalba. The one who really believes in Allah, Allah will guide his heart. He will be able to see in difficulties also an exam. And he will say, I need to put the right answer to this question. I must not fail. The one who does not believe in an exam, whenever difficulty comes, he will say, why did my Allah disgrace me? Allah Tawarukta says, وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ And then when Allah brings that exam and things become tight, then He says, Rabbi Ahanan, my Allah is disgracing me. Allah says, Kalla. This is not the world for disgrace. This is not the world for honor. This is the time to write an exam. I'm writing it, you are writing it. Then we will hand it in. After that is the time to either be ready to celebrate or to be ready to cry. The name of the surah was At-Taghabun. Taghabun means the day that the loss will really become apparent. Thalika yawmut taghabun. Allah says on that day, you people saw it, we heard it. South Africa saw a small scene of Qiyamah. But it was a very small scene. And it was not Qiyamah. In this small scene of Qiyamah, the man who took a loss also, if those who we met after a few days whose iman was strong, they says, when I came I had nothing. And that Allah who gave the first time can give me again. I'm going to start. And he starts. But another day is coming. Where the non-believer will say, give me one more chance to start again. And it will be said, no more chance. 
That will be the day of real loss. On this day, in this world, it's not called a loss. Because the result can sometimes be unique. We'll just leave that Amil and his Tawis for a while. We'll just mention on this point and we'll come back. Those that saw difficulty in the looting. Those that saw difficulty because of Corona. Those who perhaps might see difficulty in the future. I want you all to always remember this one incident. Which shows that sometimes a difficulty today could become a flower tomorrow. Sometimes the thorn today could become the rose tomorrow. That man whose iman allows him to stand, he perhaps with his own eye will see it. But as long as he understands this world is the exam, when Pakistan was formed, there were hardly any Darul Ulums in Pakistan. Perhaps there were none. Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Shafi Sahib Rahimullah, whose Ma'ariful Quran is famous, he was one of the leading scholars who reached the soils of Pakistan. He was his Ustad, Allama Shabir Ahmad Usmani. And the government asked them to lay the foundations now for an Islamic Pakistan. And they made a lot of effort for it, but you always have shaitans in the government. When all the work was done, it was like shell to a great extent. A lot of effort in it. During that effort, he wanted to establish his Darul Ulum. Allama Shabir Ahmad Usmani passed away because he had worked for Pakistan and he had sacrificed so much, the government placed, gave a certain place for his grave. Perhaps it was going to become a graveyard after that. Mufti Muhammad Shafi was very close to the government, so he wrote that the honor of this individual is not just a graveyard, but around it if you can establish a madrasa, which will be a yadgar, a remembrance for him forever. And every student who studies it will be called in the remembrance of Allama Shabir Ahmad. So the government also looked inclined towards it and the recommendations were given. It was taken into parliament. It was a very long story. They took very long. By that time, Mufti Shafi Sahib started his own Darul Ulum. It started getting bigger and bigger. Now there was no place. Then someone said, why don't you remind the government? Someone shelved this. They must pull it out. So they sent to tell the government people, we want you all to come and see what is a madrasa. They came, they looked at the Darulum, they were shocked. They said, this is supposed to be there. And they immediately went into preparation. Mufti Shafi Sahib wrote a second thing to the government. That I want my madrasa to be there. But the family of Allama Shabir Ahmad Usmani, his wife, and his nephews and nieces who have come from India, they must get plots. Because this is their family member. So he asked for the plots. When the government signed it, they added two extra names. Mufti Muhammad Shafi's name will also get a plot. And the other main ustad of the madrasa. Mufti Shafi Sahib wrote back to them, that my plot and this ustad's plot that you all gave, we thank you all. But we will not take any benefit from this land. That will also go to the madrasa. So we don't want a plot. So much he did. He got land for the family. And then he was going to have his opening now, Jalsa. For the Jalsa, the main ministers of Pakistan, ambassadors of Saudi, it was the first madrasa Darul Ulum of Pakistan. Dawa namas were written to top ulama of the country, of the world. And many of them said, we'll be there, and they came. And just before that first jalsa, where they're going to lay the foundation, one person already says, so much of thousands of rupees, I'm going to take it on my head. At that time, it was a huge amount. Everything was ready. And then an argument starts within the family. One of the nephews, perhaps, or someone far, they mentioned to the family, to the woman of the family that why must he get this land when it's your husband's grave? You must not allow him to get it. You must ask for it. They even write that that poor woman, what she even knew about politics. 
But because of whatever happened, Allama Shabir Ahmad Usmani's family wrote a letter to say that if their madrasa is coming up, it must be our madrasa. And it must be in the family. And in that family, there were hardly any ulama. So a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion. Imagine the jalsa is happening. Mufti Muhammad Shafi Sahib said, we will have the jalsa because great ulama came, but we will not put the foundation. Ulama told him, are you crazy? Then the government people said to him, we will not listen to them. They have no right in this land. So much. And during those days, he used to narrate one hadith. He would say, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I stand guarantee for a plot in the best part of Jannah for the one who is ready to let go of his rights. Even if he is on the right, I stand guarantee for the best plot in Jannah. A nazaimun bi baytin fi wasatil Jannah. For the one who lets go of his right, he doesn't want to fight with his family. Walau kana muhiqan, he is on the right. He got the proof with him, he can fight it. But when everyone is coming to tell him, he's narrating this hadith. And he says, do you want me to put the foundation of my madrasa on a fight? He says, as long as the family don't give the go-ahead, I will not step into this. He said, you all can run the madrasa. Unique sentence, he said, I'm not running a shop here. I'm not putting up a shop. He never took it. It was a surprise, it was a shock. Ulama, great ulama later on said, we heard the hadith, but we learnt it from him. We had heard the hadith, but we learnt it from him. It's easy to say it for me and you. You got your top madrasa going to come up in the center of Karachi. Mufti Muhammad Taqi Sahib says, when narrating this incident, he says how hard it was. People knew that a madrasa will never come up now. And they knew Allama Shabir Ahmad Usmani will never get that honor now. And they're trying to tell my father, but one narration on this. He says, but when time passed, when time passed, he pulled out and the government said if he's not taking it for his madrasa, then all that allocation of land will not go to the family. So none of the family members got anything. And the initial owner of that land, after seeing that big jalsa and everything was ready, the builders were all there, he decided, okay, if something has to be built, he decided to build in the place of a madrasa, he built like a college. And the right in a place where deen would have been taught, it ended off as dunya. Where it would have been taught for free, money was now being taken. He says, what was the purpose? Mufti Muhammad Shafi Sahib, within a while, short while after that, someone from South Africa contacted him and said, I got a land. If you want to put up your madrasa, go and see that land. And that is where the famous, it's called Darulum Karongi, if anyone goes to Pakistan, in the entire Pakistan, perhaps it's the most famous madrasa, or amongst the most famous. But what sabr he had to make, and then when Allah gave it, the place when they went to go see the madrasa, it was far away from the city. Even the buses couldn't go there properly. And when the students were studying there, they say at night they would hear hyenas at night. They say during the day the scorpions would run away from the students, but at night the students had to run away from the scorpions. That was the madrasa. He said every night or every few nights someone would get bit by a scorpion. It was part of it. Right? And there was no doctors in that area far away from Karachi. He says the students themselves became doctors. So then they decided, let's look for the, like what you will call this, antibiotic, what you will call this, the vaccine for the scorpion. So he said, we experimented with so many things. Finally, he says, we found the most beneficial, whether it's true or not, but they found it, that if someone gets bitten by a scorpion, bring one small child and tell him, urinate. And he would urinate on it, a small child. 
So Mufti Taki Sahib, when he narrates it, he would say, there would always be a young child ready. And he would say, do your thing. He said, we had no doctor. We lived in that. Mufti Shafi Sahib was still in Karachi. He says, we had to come and study in the madrasa. It was scary. It was dangerous. The hyenas were making sounds at night. Today, if you see Darul Karongi, you will never think once upon a time, this was what he got in the place of what he lost. But he says, today go to Karachi and go and see where the grave of Allama Shabir Ahmad Usmani is. And you will see that university there. And no one even knows it. He says, years later I told the government that people have forgotten the grave of Allama Shabir. Can you make one other road at least towards it? So that we can go and visit his grave. That was his ustad. Then they made a road. Because had that road not been there, no one was even visiting the grave. And then when you go to Karongi on the other side, it will give a message to the people of the world. That in this world, if you give up your rights for Allah, Allah will make you smile in this world and He will make you smile in the next also. No person has ever let go of a right except that he shone. No person ever fought for every cent except that he took him down. How many empires we saw, they fought for the last rand or dollar of that inheritance. Where the brother said, I'll make sure my sister doesn't get it. Say, what she needs the money for? I was working in the shop. He never ever thought that that sister will cry, that cheer will fall on the ground and an entire garden of revenge will come up. A garden of revenge, meaning a day will come when Almighty Allah will show revenge. It might not show on the child and it will show on the grandchild. It might show on the great grandchild. Sometimes the whole empire comes to the ground. Sometimes the empire remains, the people all get knocked on the ground. This is a world where when we say loss, it's not always a loss. And it is a world where we say, I got what I wanted, it's not always a gain. The Quran verse says, Watch out for that day. So now coming back to the Amil. He said, if there's one person who can help this girl, it's that man. The girl is taken. From the top he says, what are you doing? What are you doing? He says, this girl is sick. And we know that you have the cure. He says, I don't do this. And as that girl is screaming, screaming, screaming. And that shaitan had even told them that I know him. He acts hard to get. So all you do is you leave your sister. You put up a small shed so that the animals do not attack her. When she will scream in the dark parts of the night, he will not be able to sleep. And he will come down and he will cure her. You go and see her, the next day you will find her much more calm. And they built it. They built it. And they left her to leave your own sister in the night. He told them you will have to leave her, but otherwise he will not come down. And when she scream and scream, then the same shaitan goes in his mind. And he says, what kind of pious man are you? A girl is dying and you got the power. What harm will he do to you just to go and blow on her? And he goes down and he makes the blow and everything comes right. He also gets shocked. I never knew I'm so powerful. He also gets shocked. Everything is calm and they come the next morning and they found she has slept nicely. But he had told them that it's not the end. You have to leave her for a few weeks. So it all comes out. All comes out. And during the nights, every few nights, the scream starts. And again he goes down. And every time he comes, he spends a little bit more time with the girl. Now he starts talking to her. Now they become friendly. Now he's not just blowing. Now she is an innocent, good, pious. What nice character. It's not nice that she must go through pain. Like how normally whenever someone falls in love, sometimes a person falls in love with a non-Muslim girl. So when he phones, his usul is the seer. That we try to explain to him that if your parents don't want you to marry her, 
Then he says, must I let her go in Jahannam? So normally we say the whole world of non-Muslims, you only saw one. Only one. That word, must I let her go in Jahannam? I'll never allow it. If I don't marry her, she will leave the fold of Islam. Like, we cry like. So that poor, what a poor girl. Must she suffer her whole life? And then he spoke and he got closer and when you get close and the barrier lifted and then he did what he never thought he would ever do. And now when he's back making his ibadah, the thought comes to his mind or the same shaitan says to him, what if one day she tells? What if? Because now promise you won't tell. What if she tells? And then thinking what to do now, he said, the easiest is to make sure she doesn't ever get the chance to tell. It won't be hard for him to kill her because he just has to say he heard her screaming one night and she died. And then he killed her. And it's a very long story that how the brothers then found out that there was a murder. All of them have the same dream at night where the sister is saying, I never die, I was murdered. All of them. Next day, breakfast time, they all said, one says, I had a very amazing dream last night. But dreams are dreams, but if three people have the same dream, then we all say, this is like wahidas. All of them had the same dream. I wasn't killed. I never die. I was murdered. So now the body will be taken out, exhumed. They will look for signs. They find out it is true. She was murdered. They go and they bring him down and they interrogate him and he admits finally. A very long story, then in the ending they're going to kill him. Why I mention the story to you? This point is actually mentioned in the incident. That sometimes the very shaitan who brings the sickness is the one who brings the cure also. Sometimes the very shaitan who brings the sickness is the one who brings the cure. And where the sickness comes with so much of problems, you must be ready for the cure to come also with so much problems. How do you save yourself from the sickness and the cure? The answer is Al-Quran. As this world is moving so fast towards an unknown, we call it the fitan of the jal, we call it the open fitan of the jal, we call it the hardest of times, the hardest of exams. It's called the time when a person's iman will be tested to the brinks. While walking in that direction, not knowing can I trust or can't I trust. What you thought is for my benefit is against me. Allah's Nabi says, the time will come where the liar will be called the most truthful. And the most truthful will be regarded as the liar. When the one who betrays the most will be trusted by all. And the one who's supposed to be trusted, everyone will say, don't listen to him. In such an environment, how will an individual know where to walk? The answer is Al-Quran. You have to start reading so much Quran. Those who started with Corona, they said within a few days of Surah Baqarah, within a few days at night, there's no sounds anymore. But again we told them, carry on that Surah Baqarah. Until your house becomes clean of the effects of the jinn. Because when Corona came, it was not only a sickness that visited, an entire army came with it. An entire army and this army, when they come, they don't like to leave. You need them to get them out of the house. Then they have to come out of the system. They have to be pulled out of the mind. They have to pull out of the heart. As long as we got a jinn within us or around us, life is going to be miserable. And the very shaitan who brings the sickness, if that shaitan is the one who brings the cure, then you can understand they will force us to take that cure. When they will force the world to take the cure, the answer again will be Al-Quran. You will have to read so much of Quran that it will have to take out whatever they wanted to put in. If it is coming with thoughts of kufr, Quran has to take it out. If it is coming with even worse shayateen and jinn, Quran has to pull it out. We know a time will come 
Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that then just before the Dajjal, there will be two tents that will be put up. A tent is something different from a building. A building, it takes a while to build. In today's time, it doesn't even take a while. But in the past, in the past, a building took long, but a tent overnight, overnight a tent comes up. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, until two tents will be erected. Meaning overnight the world will change. It will either be a tent in which there will be hypocrisy and there will be no iman. We are not speaking of non-Muslims. Speaking about amongst the Muslims. There will be such a change overnight. That there will be a tent put up of hypocrisy in which there will be no iman. There will be an Ahmad and a Muhammad and a Zaid in that tent. But they will hate Islam and Allah even more than the devil. A tent of hypocrisy in which there will be no iman. How will that tent come up so quickly? Tent, sudden, overnight, it wasn't here yesterday, what happens? Will it be that the maktab will close? We're not seeing the maktabs close. Will it be that the darul rooms will all be brought to the ground? It doesn't seem because the madrasas are becoming more and more. Will it be there will be no Islam in the world? No way. There's a revolution taking place. Afghanistan was the beginning. Turkey is the beginning. Qatar is the beginning. A revolution is taking place. So what will cause an Ahmad to become a John? What will make him hate Islam so much? Something has to be brought in the near future. Something has to be brought that changes a man's thoughts, changes the way he looks at life, changes what he says is right and what's wrong. Perhaps later on he will say, when I was young I used to believe whatever I was told, now no more I make that mistake. Someone will say, what changed you? He'll say, I don't know, but this is the right to become so stubborn. There were those who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa himself gave da'wah to himself. But because they were stubborn, they saw a miracle. They said, if this pebble in your hand reads kalima, I'll believe. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said to the pebble, read kalima. It read in the man's hands. Hearing it reading, the man threw it on the ground. They said, we want to see the moon split, then we will believe. He said, I will show you the splitting of the moon. He split it, they saw it. They said, he has made magic on our eyes, so stubborn. They said, but magic doesn't travel. We will wait for the others. Travelers will come within a few days. We'll ask them, did you see anything amazing? They said, we saw something, but can you mention, we saw the moon like split. They said, Sihrum Mustamir. This is magic that went very far. When a man becomes stubborn, even the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the miracle of the splitting of the moon will not change that individual. We are scared of a future coming where there's a tent of nifaq, hypocrisy, in which there will be no iman. That if a scholar wants to go and save Zaid, Ahmad, Fatima, Aisha, they will say to him, you rather go to the non-Muslims and give them dawah because this tent hates Islam like anything. And then there will be another tent of Iman in which there will be no hypocrisy. How will that tent come up? Because the same tools which the devil will use on this tent will be used on that tent. The same tools he will use on this tent to make them hypocrites. He will use it on that tent also. But when Allah's decision is made, some will walk to the right and some will walk to the left. What will be the difference between the two groups? It will be Al-Quran. That individual who held on and read and read and read Quran. When difficulties will come, he will still love Allah. And when ease will come, he will love Allah. 
When things what he likes to see will come, he will thank Allah. And when difficulties will come, he will make sabr saying, I'm doing it for Allah. Perhaps the looting that took place was one of the hardest for our people. But if an individual's iman allows him to see further, perhaps he might be able to say, my Allah, if there was no good written for me in it, you would never have done this to me. I trust you so much that I understand that there must be some good in it. And then that man will walk. That individual will find his tent of iman in which there is no hypocrisy starts immediately. The difficulties of the times will be shaitan and the jal's tool. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, when they will come to the farmer, and they will say to him, times are very difficult. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, before the jal's coming, there will be years of great drought. He says, in one of those years when the waters will come from the sky, but it will hold back one third of its waters. One third means one third of the crop and the earth will hold back. Very difficult here. And then all the people in the world who are suffering will say, we hope next year will be better. We just need to get out of this. And he says, when the next will come, it could be the next year, it could be after. Just when you say, I'm getting ready again. He says, when the drought will come, the sky will be told, hold back half of yours. Or two thirds of yours. And the earth will hold back two thirds. I want you to think about me and you in that time. When prices will be rocketing and that business which I needed to pay off that house and to pay off that other project will not be giving again. Corona gave us a glimpse of difficulty. The looting gave us a glimpse of difficulty. Mubarak to the individual who says when this was so hard for my iman, I better from today start preparing for future exams because I cannot lose my iman. He says when the third year will come and the sky will hold its entire rain and the earth will hold everything and there will not be that four-legged except that it will be found dead. During that year, it will be devastating for the people of the world. In such conditions, if the Jal comes, which comes in a narration, he will go to a farmer and he will say, Trust me, and I will bring the waters falling on your land. He says he will see his animals coming fatter than they were ever. At that time, which person's iman will be able to say to him, That if the world has to go, I'm going to let it go. But I will not risk my iman. Because another world is coming where loss will open up only there. The individual who took those two exams, Corona and the looting of recent times, as a lesson that if I am gripped in my world, and as soon as I find someone pulling it, I become so devastated that whoever puts his hand front to say, must I help you, I'm ready to grab it. Then I'm at a very great risk that I will be holding the hand of the devil also. But if sabr was blessed given to me in this exam, and I cried, but I cried to Allah, not against Allah. And I made an effort to make a step forward. And I said, there must be some goodness in this. And Allah only you know. وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ The one who believes in Allah. يَهْدِ قَلْبَ Allah will open up his heart. And he will see goodness where no one else can see goodness. He will smile where everyone else is crying. He will laugh where everyone else is frowning. Where everyone is looking for courage, he will become the source of courage. May Allah make me and may Allah make you such individuals. My brother Mawlana Musa prepared this kitab, Calamities in the Life of a Muslim. So it was printed in the last week perhaps. So his desire was that he sent perhaps about 80 copies. So obviously there will be more people. But it shouldn't be like every child comes and takes. So one 
person from every family, take one and then read it in the house and after that pass it on. And let somebody else read and somebody else read. This calamity in the life of a Muslim is exactly what I am saying to you now. That this world is not a garden of paradise. It's an exam. And going towards the end, the exam is going to become more and more and more difficult. Allah bless us all with afiyat, with izzat, with rahat, with salamati. No one likes to write a difficult exam. But Allah made it perhaps that we are near the end. We are near the end perhaps. And everyone says, I wish I can meet Isa alayhi salam. I wish I can be part of the Mahdi. Perhaps we will get that opportunity. But there were those people who said, I wish we can meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some of them went all the way to Medina Munawwara. They put up their house there. They put up their business there. They said, I wish I can meet. I wish I can meet. And then because time stretched, when Allah's Nabi Wasallam finally did come to them, they thought he will come with no exam. And when they saw exam, they were the ones saying, I wish he never came. I wish he never came. But there was another group who grabbed him. They became the Ansar. They became the saviors of the Islamic spirits. And there was a group that waited for him, but they were not ready to be tested. Soon as they saw that their power might go, their wealth might go, they changed their whole story. And they said, I wish he had never come. May me and you be that mujahid, that fighter, that we say, Allah, my life, my family, my wealth, my everything is for you. But I ask you for afiyat. وَلَكِنْ عَافِيَتُكَ أَوْسَعُ لِي Allah's Nabi Wasallam went to Taif. He had so much of hope. The people of Taif will listen to him. They never listened. They pelted him. We know the incident. Then he was bleeding. Then he made this dua. This is the dua me and you perhaps have to make now. He said, إِلَّمْ تَكُنْ سَاخِتًا عَلَيَّ فَلَا أُبَالِي First he said, Allah, that who have you made in charge of my matter? That they so powerful, they can play the strings, they can take the carpet under my feet, they can collapse my business just like that. So he said, who have you made in charge of me? This was Makkah Mukarrama. And then he said, إِلَّمْ تَكُنْ سَاخِتًا عَلَيَّ فَلَا أُبَالِي But Allah, as long as I know you're not angry with me, then I will be okay also. As long as I know you are not angry with me, فَلَا أُبَالِي I'm also okay. غَيْرَ أَنَّ عَافِيَتَكَ أَوْسَعُ لِي He says, but yes Allah, I do ask for afiyat. That if my exam can be easy, that will be the best. Me and you must learn this dua. إِن لَمْ تَكُنْ سَاخِتًا عَلِيَّ فَلَا أُبَالِي And if you can't get the Arabic, then say the English. This opened up the heavens. An angel came down. He says, Allah sent an angel who has never come to earth before this. He's in charge of the mountains. You give the go-ahead, the mountains will come together. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, I do not want destruction. I want the people of this land to get iman one day. And Allah opened it. He said, this was the dua that opened up the world for hidayat. إِلَّمْ تَكُنْ سَاخِتًا عَلَيَّ فَلَا أُبَالِي if you're not angry with me, Allah, then I'm also okay. However, afiyat is something I would love. When it opened up the doors of the heavens for hidayat for the world, if me and you make the dua, inshallah, it will open up our future also. إِلَّمْ تَكُنْ سَاخِتًا عَلَيَّ فَلَا أُبَالِي غَيْرَ أَنَّ عَافِيَتَكَ أَوْسَعُ لِي وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا عَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْحَمْدُ